All right, uh, my name is Jocelyn Ramirez. I'm the chef and founder of Todo Verde, which is a plant-based food business here in Los Angeles, focused on uh, creating nostalgic flavors, creating the, the recipes that we grew up eating in plant-based versions. And so I'm going to be leading us through this Tres Leches cake, which is a cake that my family used to eat for all the celebrations we used to, um, get it ordered from this senora who was based in Linwood, um, which is the city right next to where I grew up in Southgate. And she would make like an uh, almond based Tres Leches cake, which was so, so good. It was um, Tres Leches de Nueces. And so it had like all these nuts throughout. It was just so good. So like all the baptisms, all the birthdays, all the everything, quinceañeras, that was our go-to cake. So I grew up eating a lot of Tres Leches. It wasn't the typical Tres Leches, but it's so, so good. And so this variation that we're making today, um, I like to first of all preface the fact that like I'm not a baker, I'm a cook. So baking is not always my like go-to, I'm super great at it. However, um, you know, I do like to bake every now and then. I do think it's fun. And when I've shared this cake with other people, they do enjoy it. So I figured, hey, why not share it with other folks? So technically this one, because we're using coconut cream as the frosting and we have um, almond milk, we have uh, uh, cashew milk, and we also have oat milk as the tres leches base. It's technically kind of like a cuatro leches because we have the coconut cream in there as well. Um, and that gives it like another layer of flavor. I didn't want to do coconut milk in the actual tres leches because it, I wanted the cake itself to still feel like pretty close to the original flavors of a tres leches. So I'm gonna get into the ingredients. I'll talk a little bit about why I'm using particular things, just especially for folks who are new to plant-based versions of these baked goods. I mean, we don't use egg and regular butter and all these things that people are typically used to using in traditional, quote unquote, traditional baked goods. Um, so I'll be using things like flax meal, coconut oil. I'll talk a little bit about these things. It's really, really easy replacements to include in your typical baked goods. Um, so let me get into it. So I'm going to pan down and talk a little bit about flax meal, which is my egg replacer. Now there's a variety of different egg replacers that we can use uh, throughout plant-based cooking. Flax meal happens to be one of them. Some people use uh, uh, chia seeds that they grind down to a meal. Essentially what you're trying to create is a consistency that kind of binds and pulls things together. Um, and so flax meal for me, I really like because I know exactly what's in it. It's pretty straightforward. It's just one ingredient. So it's less processing. Um, you could use other things like a uh, Bob's Red Mill egg replacer, which is a powder that includes like psyllium husk and other things that essentially kind of help congeal and bind things together, which is what an egg's purpose is in a lot of baked goods. Now, the other thing I will just say for egg replacers in general in plant-based cooking. There are other things that you can use um, for other types of recipes. Like for example, Follow Your Heart does have one that's a powder version, but it's, a, it's called egg replacer. It's in a little egg carton. And that particular egg replacer I like to use for the flan that I make because it tastes like egg. Where like this, obviously it's flax seeds. It does not taste like egg. <laughs> so the follow your heart version has that kind of sulfury. They use black salt to get that egg flavor and consistency. And in fact, you could add water to that powder and make like a quote unquote scrambled egg. There is another um, uh, egg replacer on the market called Just Egg that also is supposed to emulate a scrambled egg. Now those I don't really use for baking. Um, I just tend to use something straightforward like a flax seed, which is kind of my go-to egg replacer for baking. But just know that in plant-based cooking, there are different types of egg replacers that I use for different types of things. So this would never be a scrambled egg, but the just egg and the follow your heart are scrambled egg um, alternatives. And so I use those for something more like a flan versus a cake itself. So all you have to do is for, in this case, I'm gonna make three flax eggs. So I have three tablespoons of flax meal and I have some water. I'm gonna go ahead and measure it out here together. I'm just gonna add seven and a half 
tablespoons of just regular tap or room temp water. Actually, this is filtered water, but it's room temp. And would it be the same for the egg replacer too? The same ratio? So for the egg replacer, I would still do something like, cause they'll typically tell you how much makes a one egg, you know, approximately one egg. So you would mm -hmm. add whatever it would be to make about three eggs to the, to the recipe. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's six, seven, and then I'm going to just eyeball a half. And then, so this is seven and a half tablespoons of just room temp filtered water, whatever water you have on hand, three tablespoons of flax. And right now it's just gonna look like a little, you know, like a very liquidy, watery consistency. But you have to set this aside for a few minutes to allow the flax to absorb some of that water. And then you will, within a few minutes, be able to see a little bit more of this sort of egg whisked egg consistency that feels like it's a little bit more congealed. So we're just going to set this aside. You would do something very similar for like a chia. Um, sometimes people don't do that with chia. Sometimes they just add chia to the actual mixture until it feels like it kind of thickens up. I've seen people do it different ways. Um, but yes, again, if you are using that sort of the other versions of the egg replacers, you want to use about three eggs worth of whatever mixture you're using. So I'm setting that aside. I'm gonna pull up here with my one and a half cups of flour. Now I typically use wheat flour. However, my store didn't have it last time. I went into the grocery store. And so I had to pick up a big old bag of organic um, all purpose flour. So that's what I have here on hand. That's what I'm using. I'm going through that whole bag. Sometimes it's just about whatever you're able to get. Right now at this point, I wasn't gonna go to like three different grocery stores looking for something specific. Um, and so really important when you're measuring your flour, I already did it here, but typically what I see folks do is that they'll get the big old bag of flour and they'll get their measuring cup and they'll stick the measuring cup inside of the bag and scoop out and really compact that one cup or half cup or whatever measuring receptacle that you're using. And you wanna try to not do that. Um, sometimes when I do stick the measuring cup inside of the bag, I'll kind of um, move the bag. Let's pretend this is a bag, right? And it stands upright. I'll kind of move the bag sideways. So like a bunch of the flour is like in the bottom area. I'll stick the cup in and then I'll kind of move the bag so that it just kind of falls into the cup measurement. Um, and then that way you get a really light fluffy true one cup or true half cup, true measurement, rather than a really compacted measurement, because then you'll end up with a drier cake, drier pancakes, drier cookies, drier whatever, um, because your ratio of, of the dry ingredient, the flour in this case, is going to be a little bit more heavy handed than uh, the ratio of whatever the wet ingredients are that you're using. So again, I have a half, uh, one and a half cups of whatever flour that you have on hand, I typically use a wheat flour and that yields a cake that's kind of a darker um, color, a more dense consistency. This one is gonna be a little lighter in color, a little fluffier, whatever it is that you typically enjoy. And then going on with the dry goods here, I'm going to be using, um, I have some baking soda, baking powder. So I have one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, which is gonna help my cake rise. I have one and a half tablespoons of baking powder, sorry, baking soda. So baking powder, one and a half teaspoons, baking soda, one and a half teaspoons. So same measurement. And then I have three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. I'm just using a flaky kosher salt here. And then I have half a cup of raw sugar. Now I went pretty light on the amount of sugar that I'm adding here as compared to other cakes because we are making this Tres Leches kind of syrupy um, topping that's gonna get infused into the cake and that's gonna be sweet. So you don't need to make this cake super duper sweet. In fact, um, I'm actually not a sweet tooth. I've become more of a sweet tooth because my partner absolutely loves sweets. Um, but I typically am not a huge fan. So I don't like things that are overly sweet. If you do like sweet, you can always, always add a little bit more of that sugar. Now, I like to use this like really flaky, um, 
uh, kind of crystallize raw turbinado sugar, just low on the spectrum of processing. And I have half a cup of that. So these dry ingredients are gonna get sprinkled in. Actually, I'm gonna get a bigger uh, bowl because I already know this little bowl is not gonna cut it. So I have my one and a half cups of flour. If your flour has lots of lumps in it, you can always sift it through a fine mesh strainer and just to get any of those lumps out. Then I have my half cup sugar, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, baking soda, my half cup of sugar. I'm gonna grab my whisk and I'm going to whisk this all together just to fully incorporate all the ingredients here. I see a little lump of something. Let's see if I find it again. But just here, you're just trying to incorporate all your dry ingredients, break up any little clumps that you see. And then I'm going to leave a little well at the center, which is where I'm gonna pour in my wet ingredients. Let's check in to see how our little flax meal is doing here. So you can see that it's already kind of thickening up, way thicker, right? It's not that watery consistency. And if I pull now you're seeing, it's kind of this thicker um, consistency that's gonna act as my binding agent. So I'll add this in just a moment. I'm gonna grab my other wet ingredients. So I have, Let me bring these all over. I have one and a half cups. I'm just using an unsweetened almond milk here that I'm just gonna pour into the center of my batter. So again, that's one and a half cups of just regular unsweetened almond milk. And then I have a quarter cup of melted coconut oil. So this is acting as our butter here. This is acting as uh, something that's gonna add that little bit of um, Kind of moisture and um, that consistency that you expect in a cake. Alternative to this, you can use a vegan butter, which typically has coconut oil in it, or you could use um, a, what is it that I'm thinking of here? Applesauce. So applesauce is something that I typically also use in baked goods. However, I didn't, I didn't want this cake to be super moist, uh, the cake itself, because I am adding lots of moisture with the um, tres leches. So I didn't wanna incorporate that here, um, all that moisture, but it yields a really like fluffy, moist, um, kind of like denseness with the moistness. Um, and so applesauce is a great uh, replacer for oil and things like that inside of your cakes. Um, I'm going to add here, two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar, two teaspoons of vanilla that are already combined it together in this little bowl. So again, two teaspoons apple cider vinegar and two teaspoons. I'm using a vanilla blend. I use a brand called Molina. So it's a lot more mellow uh, than a extract. If you find that your extract is very potent, you can go a little bit lighter. You don't have to add a whole two teaspoons. Perhaps you add one teaspoon um, and see how you like that flavor. So I'm adding that in and then I will go ahead and add in my flax. So you can see here that nice kind of thick, goopy kind of consistency that the flax is gonna provide. It'll loosen up once it's in the overall batter, but it's gonna help bind everything together. So let me go ahead and start whisking from the center and kind of combining everything together, kind of scraping the sides of the bowl, getting all that flour mixed in. And I'm just using a whisk here. If you have a hand mixer and want to use that, you can. It should come together pretty easily though. So you shouldn't really have the need for that. You just want to really go through and make sure that you're turning your bowl, scraping the sides. You can use your whisk or a spatula to do so. And you should have something that looks a lot like a pancake batter. In fact, you can probably make pancakes out of this. So just make sure everything is well incorporated that you don't see any major lumps there. And the other thing I like to do, which I actually already kind of put aside here is, you know, the bowl, I had already measured out my coconut oil, right? 
And so this bowl has a little bit of that coconut oil residue in it. And so what I typically like to do is get my baking dish. And I just like to flip over the bowl in there or the measuring receptacle, whatever it is that I used for the coconut oil and just let that kind of melt down into the baking dish. Sometimes I'll use my hand or a spatula and then that will help me moisten up uh, or grease the pan that I'm going to bake the cake in. Um, of course, you can get additional coconut oil. You can, you know, use um, uh, vegan butter or whatever. Like, but I just, I'm like always like, oh, let me just use every little last bit of whatever was already in this bowl because it's just going to go down the drain anyway. So you just want to make sure that you grease the sides and the corners and the bottom of your baking dish just to avoid any sticking from happening. I especially like to really get into the corners. What size baking dish are you using? This, that's a great question. This baking dish is probably about like a 10 by like seven or eight. Uh, so it's just a rectangular baking dish. Uh, it's, it's only gonna bake up off about like halfway through. This is a fairly small cake. Um, to be frank, it's like pretty, pretty, like a little baby cake because it's typically just my partner and I, so I'm not trying to bake a huge cake anyway. Um, so I would recommend something like that, that size, or um, I do have round baking dishes, but for tres leches, that's not typically how you would bake a tres leches cake in a round, like double stacked cake or double layered cake. So... I'm using this one. So now that I have that, I'm going to just tap any excess batter off my whisk, get rid of that. And I am going to use my spatula here to pour into my baking dish. It's already a grease baking dish. I use that excess coconut oil, which technically is supposed to be part of the recipe, but we all know there's a little bit that always stays behind. So. I'm just going to use my spatula to make sure I scrape every little last bit of the batter out of the bowl or as much as I possibly can, get all of that in there. And so as you can see, it comes together super, super easily. It's a pretty easy, straightforward cake to make. It's just a vanilla cake, essentially, just like a regular vanilla cake. Um, you can frost this in any way you like, but of course, you we're going we're going to give it that nice soak with the tres leches, which we'll work on in just a moment. So, I had already preheated my oven to 350. It's ready to go. It beeped right when class started. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add this for about 45 minutes into my preheated oven. Make sure it's preheated. Um, if your oven is sometimes a little bit off, you can always pick up an oven thermometer because even though it may say 350, it may actually be baking at a different temperature. So especially if you have an older oven, it's kind of nice to have that thermometer because then you can truly gauge where your temp is. Because you might say, oh, 45 minutes and mine is like nowhere near done. Maybe yours needs an hour, but it might be because you're actually baking at a lower temperature than 350. So that oven thermometer will really be a better gauge for you. So again, 45 minutes or more if needed, you wanna be able to pierce this with either like a toothpick or a fork until it comes out clean. Um, and then you know it's done, it's gonna be nice and inflated and kind of spongy. And we're gonna go ahead and pop that in the oven. I like to put it on the top rack just cause that's where it gets hottest. Really important, make sure you set up a timer. I can't stress that enough. Don't don't use your like your senses to just be like, oh, I know when the cake's done. <laughs> really just set up a timer, put it on your phone, put it on your oven, and just make sure that you're keeping track of that time. So let me go ahead and clean up my station here. Put all this in the sink, and then we'll get started with the um, the actual tres leches. And I'm gonna clean my whisk too, cause I'm gonna use that right now. So 
All right, so any questions? You doing okay? Yeah, I think it's going okay. Good. okay. Yeah, the egg replacer binded so quickly. I've never yeah. used it, so I'm excited about Which it. Which one did you end up using? I got the um, the Bob's. Yeah, the Bob's Red Mill, I, I have that one too. It's amazing. So yeah, it's so great. You can do so much with it. Um, besides baked goods, like I've even made like, um, I don't know if you've ever made tortillas de papa, like their mm -hmm. potato. Yeah, like you can use that to kind of bind it together. You can use it for a ton of different sweet and savory mm -hmm. um, in recipes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the tres leches itself. So I'm gonna bring over these ingredients. I need my almond milk, my cashew milk, my oat milk. Um, I will say that I already had store-bought almond milk and oat milk that I typically have on hand. I didn't have cashew milk, but I always have cashews on hand because I make cheeses and cremas and cheesecake and all this stuff using cashews. So it was just really easy. I didn't measure it out. I just kind of eyeballed it in that like I threw some cashews in my blender, uh, maybe about like two, one to two tablespoons of cashews, maybe two tablespoons with probably about like a cup, cup and a half of water. Um, this was already filtered water. And I just let it hang out uh, for maybe about an hour. And then I blended it until it was super smooth. I did it in a, in a Vitamix, so a high power blender to make sure that I didn't have any little pieces of cashews. And because cashews are so soft, it's um, less likely that you're gonna have a pulp or little bits of nuts the same way that you might with almonds or even oats really, like the little bits of oats. Um, so I did make that one just now. Let me grab these other things. Woo, this bowl is hot because it's next to that preheated oven. All right, here we go. Are you using almond, cashew, and oat milk specifically like for this recipe for a reason or like alternative milks in general would work well? Alternative milks in general would work well. I just wanted to play on that, like the fact that it's three milks, you know? So typically in a traditional version of Tres Leches, there's three different types of milks. There's a sweetened, condensed, evaporated, and what's the third one? Um, I can't remember what the third one is, but it's like three different versions of milk essentially. So I was like, okay, I like the way that oat kind of has like this, kind of like the way it coats your mouth a little bit when you drink it. So it has like that nice consistency, that smooth consistency. Almond brings more of a flavor profile forward if you have one that actually does taste like almonds. Um, and then cashews for me make everything creamy. So I was like, okay, I can really play with those three. And then of course the coconut is used as the frosting because of that fat that it brings to the table. And so it can really create like a whipped cream um, consistency. So that's why I chose those particular three. However, it could really be like just one milk, <laughs> you know, it could be a cup and a half of like whatever milk you have on hand. It doesn't need to be three different ones. Um, but I just did it because of the, you know, tres leches. Um, I also thought about in place of typically what you see in plant-based food in place of the sweetened condensed milk um, is a coconut base, like dulce de leche or sweetened condensed milk. Uh, but that does typically taste a little bit like coconut. So I didn't want to infuse coconut as the frosting and also in the cake because I thought it just would be a little too overpowering. So that's why I chose these more kind of slightly neutral flavor profiles uh, so that it just kind of feels more like the original flavors that we're used to. So I have half a cup of each. I have half a cup of my, this is the oat milk, and I can, I know that they look similar, but they do look a little bit different. Like the oat milk typically has like, um, like it kind of has a little bit of that, like uh, what's the word? Like it kind of coats the side of the, of the cup a little bit more. The color is a little bit more deep and maybe a little bit more like earthy. It has um, sort of this like more brown whitish hue to it. And then my almond milk definitely, um, feels a little bit more liquefied and it looks a little bit more on the just like pure white or maybe like eggshell color. 
And then lastly, my cashew milk. I know this is my cashew milk also because it has a little bit of foam on it because I just blended it. So it's a fresh cashew milk. It has that nice kind of creaminess, frothiness to it. And if you are making any of these milks yourself, you could also um, make them a little bit thicker. So like, you know, your almond milk could have a little bit more thickness to it. This feels kind of watered down and that's how you typically tend to find the store-bought versions to be unless you get one that's maybe a little bit more high quality. Um, and the other thing you wanna do if you are planning to make any nut milks or plant-based milks at home is it's nice to have a nut milk bag, which is essentially a bag that has very small um, perforations or holes throughout. So it's, it's more fine than a fine mesh strainer. And that will catch any little bits of your nuts or your oats or things that didn't blend. Um, for the oats, sometimes you may find that um, if your blender gets really hot and you're blending a lot and you don't have enough liquid in there, you may have sort of this like gummy kind of pulley milk. Um, but if you blend with cold water um, and you soak your, your oats in, with enough time so that they really, really do um, uh, start to absorb some of that water before you blend them, rather than just going from just dry oats and blending with liquid, um, you'll, you'll likely have a, better, a slightly better consistency of your oat milk. So again, half a cup of each, or you can choose to do, do one and a half cups of just one flavor of milk, right? And then I have a quarter cup of my raw turbinado sugar, same sugar as I'm using earlier. Because this is gonna be liquefied, alternatively, you could use a maple syrup or something like that. Um, if you wanted to choose another type of sort of um, uh, sweetener, I love maple syrup, um, but sometimes uh, the reason I didn't choose it for this particular recipe is because sometimes it will, also kind of outshine the other flavors, especially because the milk flavors are kind of subtle, but I just love maple syrup as a sweetener generally. So I, you know, I would consider it possibly for next time I make this. Um, but in this case, I'm doing a quarter cup of just my raw turbinado sugar. And then I have one teaspoon of my vanilla blend. Again, this is a Molina uh, blend. So it's a little more smooth, I would say than an extract. So you can go a little bit lighter if you need to, if you're using an extract that feels really potent. So I'm going to put all of these things into a small pot that I have on my stove. I forgot I had another bowl there for my cake. So I'm just gonna turn on the heat to about medium heat. Before it gets hot, I'm just gonna pour in all three milks. So I have my oat milk, I'm actually going to, because I have some residue that's stuck there, I'm going to do the senora thing and like I'm going to pour in my next milk, my almond milk, give it a little swirl and pour that in, make sure it's nice and cleared out. So I have my oat milk. Now I did it for that one. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> all right, let me get all that out. Come on, everybody. Let's get in there. So that now I have my three different milks. I have my cashew, my almond, my oat milk my quarter cup of sugar and my vanilla. So I will just give that a little whisk. And what you're looking for here, you can be at about a medium, medium low heat is, you know, obviously you should be able to feel the crystals of sugar, especially because turbinado is so, it's, the crystals are so big you're definitely gonna be able to feel that. So what I want here is I want to melt those crystals into the milk, um, the tres leches. And I also just wanna see a slight, ever so slightly um, like thickening of my tres leches because right now it's pretty loose and you can probably see it better if I grab a spatula. Bring this back up, here we go. So, Right now you can see with the spatula, it's super loose, pretty liquefied, doesn't stick to the back of my spatula at all. I mean, you're not gonna get like a thick sauce out of this either, but you definitely want something that's a little bit more kind of like stick to your ribs, wholesome um, consistency. I think that that just makes it a little bit better. And you don't want it to be too thick either. There's a fine line because if it becomes too thick, then 
it won't really absorb into the cake itself because um, it's just going to sit on top of the cake rather than like really going into the cake. So you do want it to be liquidy, right? But you want it to be kind of um, luscious and not so watered down. So this will take a few minutes. It's not going to take very long, especially if you're on that medium, medium low heat. You want to keep an eye on it. You don't want it to bubble over. You also don't want it to burn and, and scald the milk. It's going to taste like burnt milk. So you just wanna keep an eye on it. Right now I could already start to feel that my sugar crystals are like significantly reduced. I don't feel them scraping um, on the bottom of the pot as much as I did just a few minutes ago. I could already see a little bit of steam happening here. And I could already start to see that it's um, clinging onto my spatula a little bit more than it was just a couple minutes ago. So this is just going to take a few minutes to just cook ever so slightly. Jocelyn, are the um, traditional tres leches evaporated milk, condensed and heavy cream? Yes. Are we thinking of? Okay. Yeah. So those are typically the three milks. Obviously, they're all cow's milks, but they have different flavor profiles for each milk. So it's really the idea of like, oh, you're getting all this different kind of flavor coming in and it's all super sweetened. So, um, so it just tastes like a nice sweet milky um, uh, flavor profile. All right. You can see that it's starting to continue to stick. It's really the reason that that's happening is because it's now become, instead of like a simple syrup, it's like a milk syrup, right? So essentially you're seeing that syrup that's sticking to the back of the spatula there. If it's not thickening up quite at the rate as yours, do you think I should bump up the heat a little? You could bump up the heat a little bit. Just make sure that you're kind of babysitting it so that you're not gonna have it bubble over or anything. I don't want this to really boil. I don't, I don't even need it to come to a simmer, to be honest with you. Maybe like a very low simmer. You can see that mine is um, already steaming. I think you can see some of that steam coming out of there. But I don't want this to boil because sometimes what happens, especially with plant-based milks, is once you bring it to a rolling boil, especially if you walk away and it comes to a rolling boil, um, sometimes it breaks the 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 kind of the almonds and the water or the liquid or whatever they used to create the milk will separate from each other and you don't want that to happen you can see that steam coming out there i'm probably going to just let this go for about another minute i'm going to drop my heat a little bit so i'm a little bit in between medium and low right now and i i have made this a little bit thicker and I like that consistency. However, I do find that it, it, my cake has a hard time absorbing it because it's so thick. So I try to like literally like massage it into the cake with my spatula, like, come on, like <laughs> absorb, you know? Um, we are gonna create perforations throughout our cake with a fork to try to allow that process to happen a little bit more quickly. And of course you can taste this tres leches. And if you find, oh, I really want a little bit more of that vanilla flavor, or I really like mine extra sweet, or maybe you even have an extract um, that you want to include. Like it could be like an almond extract or a different flavor profile that you might have um, that you want to include. You can absolutely include that to make it, you know, your version of your favorite tres leches cake even if that's not the traditional version. All right, maybe just one more minute. I know I said it one minute, maybe about a minute ago, but I'm just gonna let this keep going just a little bit longer. It's still pretty much at that kind of syrupy, loose consistency. I just want it to thicken just a touch more and then I will remove it from the heat or just turn off the heat. And again, 
you should be feeling that the crystals have fully dissolved. Should be making sure you're getting a nice, like it's steaming here. It's really well incorporated, but not boiling over. And that has happened to me before where I step away for a second, let me do one more thing or let me wash this one dish, turns into five dishes and then it's boiling over. <laughs> so it totally happens. It's best to just try to stay focused here and just hang out here for a little bit. All right. I'm gonna say mine is good to go. Again, if you want yours to be any thicker, you can absolutely thicken it. In fact, um, the one that I did for the photographs that we used to promote this class, um, that syrup was slightly thicker than this one. But as you can see from the photos, I mean, that was also kind of like a photo effect too and that I wanted that cream, that tres leches to really pop in that photo and not absorb that quickly into the cake itself. So I purposely did thicken that one a little bit more. And, and you can see that it coats, it coats the cake, which is still good. Um, but if you want it to absorb, you need it to be just a little bit more loose than, than the one that we saw in the photograph. But it's at, at the end of the day, it's your choice, like whatever you prefer, if you want to have like that cool effect where like kind of, you can layer it on top of the cake and you can kind of like massage it in, you can absolutely do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat here and just let that cool down a little bit. So it's just gonna sit in this pot, hang out and just relax here. The flavors will continue to meld together. I don't really need to do anything else at this point for this particular item, except for just let it cool down before I add it to my cake itself. So any questions about that? No, not at all. I think I'm just keeping it on the heat for a little bit because I do want it a little thicker. Yeah. Um, I used, I had these, I had oat milk and almond milk already and then went to the store and they didn't have cashew milk. So I don't know if that's maybe coming into play, but I, I'm using like a pilly nut milk. Oh, interesting. Um, so I don't know if maybe that's like, not making it as thick or as that quickly. could potentially be it mm -hmm. too you know um one thing that's really important too for any store-bought milks i'm i'm pretty sure you do this but i, I make sure i shake them really really well before because mm -hmm. you have all the the thickness of the nuts or whatever settle at the bottom mm -hmm. um so just make sure you're shaking properly but yeah it could be just a different type of milk mm -hmm. so it might be a little bit looser but if you keep it on the heat long enough it will reduce down Mm -hmm. you know just again making sure that it's not gonna bubble over cool yeah yeah okay so we are gonna work on the frosting shortly let me grab the can of coconut cream that i have in my fridge it's actually been in the fridge uh, so I was going to teach this class last week, I believe, right? Um, and then I ended up feeling under the weather. I got my second dose of the vaccine and it just like threw me way off. And, um, and I had already had the cans of coconut cream in the fridge. So they've been in the fridge for a whole week. Um, and so they're nice and solidified. And so the main reason you want to um, keep your, your coconut cream First of all, you wanna use canned, not the box stuff. You don't wanna use any of that because even though it, it may be coconut cream, it's not gonna have like that thick fatty consistency that you're gonna get in a canned coconut cream. Super essential here. And then the reason you wanna refrigerate at least overnight is because what will happen is that the fat, so it's one can, right? And the fat's gonna like rise to the top. And at the bottom, you're gonna have like this loose coconut water, coconut milk consistency. Um, that's very liquefied, but the top is going to be pretty much like very creamy or in some cases like mine, 
Um, I already made a batch of this whipped cream last night just to already have one made just in case. Um, but I'm still gonna demo another one today, but you're gonna see that the coconut cream is like very thick, almost like hard um, because it's been so cold in the fridge and you really want that. Um, if, if yours, you, you feel like maybe a little bit looser, sometimes what helps is if your bowl, if you're using like a stainless steel mixing bowl or something like that, if the bowl is chilled, like if you pop it in the freezer for like 10 minutes or so, let it get nice and cold and then use that as your mixing bowl, um, that also helps. Another thing um, that I have found is like, not all canned coconut creams are the same. So some definitely have more of a high fat content than others. And so they, some might be a little bit thicker, some might be a little bit looser. It really depends, which is why the suggested use of the tapioca flour and the powdered sugar ratios are uh, ranges versus an exact amount. Because if yours is, uh, I'm using the tapioca flour here as a binder to help really um, ha have like the whipped cream in this case, right, for the, for the cake set a little bit more. And so I'm just gonna be using one tablespoon for mine because I know that based off of what I made last night, mine is gonna be nice and thick. If you find that yours is a little bit more loose, you may wanna use two tablespoons and that's gonna kind of help you congeal it um, and bring it together a little bit more. Uh, tapioca flour is something I use all the time for that purpose. I, I also have used it for ice creams. Uh, I use it for cheeses and things like that. So it's a really, really great binder. When it's introduced to heat, it has sort of this like pulley effect to it as well. And then the powdered sugar is between half a cup and three quarters of a cup. Part of that is like, again, if you want yours to be super on the sweeter side, go for the half cup. It's going to be more of that flavor profile that you might be looking for. But also the powdered sugar is gonna help to, you, you need to be cautious because if you add too much sugar, then it does kind of liquefy the, um, the cream a little bit too much. Um, but in some cases it will also kind of help to bind it. And so what I do uh, for the times that I've made this with a looser cream is bring all the ingredients together and then I pop it back in the fridge for another few hours to really allow that cream. And I've left it uncovered too. So just open bowl in the fridge of this coconut cream with the tapioca flour and the sugar. And that kind of helps to uh, maybe like evaporate some of the excess liquid, it helps it to thicken up. And then when I mix it, it's like a pretty good consistency. Um, I've probably left it in the fridge for anywhere between like four hours, to overnight even. Um, but again, this one that I have here should be like a pretty good consistency. So let me grab that. My coconut cream has three grams of fat. Is that where yours is at? Let me see. Saturated fat, 14 grams. So this one has definitely like a lot more. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. came it came to play, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me grab a bowl. This other one that I have on the stove is it got hot because of the oven. So I'm gonna be using a bowl that's kind of too big, but it's all it's all good. It's gonna be chilled or not chilled, but cooler than the other one that was on the stove. So this is a brand of coconut cream that I typically have on hand because the wholesale market where we buy a lot of Todo Verde things have this brand and I can buy it in cases. So it's my ploy. I use their coconut milk and their coconut cream. And as you just heard, it has a pretty high fat content. So it's nice and creamy. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky to open because the top is kind of a weird odd shape. So it might take me a minute to just even crack this thing open. I messed up because um, the bottom of the can is easier to open. The bottom of the can is like a regular shape. This one is kind of indented up at the top, kind of rounded off. Um, but at this point, because I've already chilled it and the fat is on the top of this can, um, and the liquids on the bottom, there's no way I can, I can flip this over now. 
I can't do that anymore because then I'd be messing up everything I'm trying to do by separating those two textures. Oh my gosh. There we go. All right. I broke through here. Let me carefully open that. So really important, don't flip it over, don't shake it. Don't do any of those things once this thing has been hanging out in your fridge as long as it has. Let me grab a spoon. So I'm just going to wedge a spoon in here and get this thing open. There we go. So you can see that nice kind of thick, look, it's like, like hard peaks. That's fatty goodness right there. Don't eat this every day, folks. Won't be good for you. Every once in a while, sweet treat. So you can see that it's nice and thick. Let me get this out of the way. Let me just throw it over here. And so all I wanna do is I wanna scoop out all of this high saturated fat, literally. Um, you can see that it's very hard, you know? Look, it sticks to my spoon. This is the consistency that comes with this particular brand. If yours is looser, it's gonna be fine. If it's looser, it's not a big deal, but um, your whipped cream may be a little bit looser generally. So you can see here, it starts to get a little bit softer the further down I go because it's now mixed in a little bit more. And I can see that cream. I wish I can, I can kind of pan down a little bit and I can see there you can kind of see some of that liquid trying to break through and I don't want to mix that liquid in at all so I'm going to be try to carefully scrape out whatever I can without disturbing so much of that cream or that liquid oh it's already starting to get through here all right once you start to get into now this liquid is like really taking over Yesterday, I was able to scoop out a lot more before breaking into that liquid, but you can kind of see here that liquid is kind of taking over. At that point, I'm not gonna get any more of that cream unless you kind of strain it out um, and then let it kind of dry out a little bit because that cream is, that liquid is going to super loosen up the whipped cream that you're trying to create. So this is as much as I was able to get out of this can, which is probably about a cup and a half yeah, probably about a cup and a half or so of um, coconut cream. I have my half cup of sugar and I have my one tablespoon of tapioca flour there. So I'll go ahead and sprinkle that on. It might actually be too much sugar for this little bit of cream that I was able to get. You can use, wow, this is like almost frozen solid right here. This one piece, two pieces that feel frozen solid. So I'm just gonna use the back of my spoon here. You can use a whisk, you can use a hand mixer, you can use whatever you need to use to break this down or to mix it up, I should say, not break it down. Wow, yeah, and this is really broken, or not broken, but like um, thick here. I wonder why it got so solidified. Usually you're not gonna see chunks like that. So I feel like that might be an issue with my fridge and that I had it in the back area where maybe it got actually, it got frozen a little bit. So mix until it gets nice and smooth, nice and creamy. You shouldn't be able to really see any lumps in there. That's where like a hand mixer will come in nice and handy. However, if you over mix, it is gonna kind of break down the cream a little bit more and it'll get a little bit more liquidy and you'll probably have to like pop it back in the fridge to help it get a little bit more solidified again. So don't mind those two chunks right there that are essentially frozen pieces. I also didn't add all of my sugar because I didn't, so I'd, I'd taste it at this point to be like, oh, is this enough sugar or do I need to add more? This does actually need a little bit more sugar. And the coconut cream is unsweetened, so you know, you'll be able to really taste if it does need more of that sugar. And the other thing I didn't do here that I, you saw is like, I just poured this in. It, it has a little bit of um, 
uh, lumps in the in the powdered sugar. And so you can definitely sift this in so that you have more of a fluffy, smooth powdered sugar in here with no lumps. So you don't have any lumps in your actual uh, frosting. Let me show you the one I did. I'm prouder of the one I made yesterday, but I essentially did the same exact process with the one from yesterday. So let me grab that from the fridge. And I did cover it because the consistency for this one was already what I was looking for. So you can see here how nice and smooth this one is. Sorry for all the loud banging here. I could see a little bit of that um, coconut milk that made its way. This is like, the, like, I don't know if you can see that liquid kind of moving around in there. So I'm just going to try to pour that out. I don't want that. Oh, it's not really gonna allow me to pour. Let me just try to scoop it out and pour it in here. So it was already separating in my already pre-made whipped cream that I made yesterday. But you can see this is like a nice kind of smooth, spreadable. You can see how much more yield I have in this batch than this batch. And this can, they were both the same size as a 19 fluid ounce um, container or can. Much more yield in this batch. And you can see because I also chilled it overnight. So I made this yesterday, let it chill overnight. Now I have this nice, very like kind of thick, whipped cream consistency where this one is very loose and definitely needs to sit in the fridge a little bit longer. So just so you can see those two different batches using the same exact process, it's not always going to be an identical process, right? But there is that. So I'm going to just pop this in the fridge as I, it doesn't really need to go in the fridge, but I'm just going to pop it in the fridge so it stays nice and chilled as we work with our actual cake. So I actually baked a cake already, even though I have one baking in the oven. So yes, I am gonna have two Perez Leches cakes. Um, good thing my neighbors are down to eat anything I make. I have neighbors on both sides, they're all vegan. So they love when I make stuff. So I'm just gonna grab a fork. You could grab a regular size fork. I'm actually gonna grab like a monster serving fork to pierce this and then I just looked at it. So because my my cake um, was nice and fluffy and I put it in this, so I baked off my cake in the dish that I used for this class right now, which was that baking dish, the glass one that was like 10 by eight. And so this one wasn't all the way cooled down before I dumped it out of that one so that I can use that same baking dish again. And you can see here that it cracked because it was still very soft, it was still warm. Um, and because it has like a little mound on the bottom, it cracked because it's not a flat surface, um, which was the top, right? The top is not the bottom in this case. So that's unfortunate. Hopefully you won't be able to tell too much once I add that whipped cream, some whipped cream is gonna sink into that. Good thing that this is like kind of like a messy cake. So we'll be able to kind of cover it up a little bit, but, in in uh, ideal world, I would have really allowed this cake to sit in that baking dish. I made this cake this morning before class. So ideally I would have at least made this cake last night, let it come to room temperature the whole evening. And then this morning I should have flipped it over into this bigger dish. And I like to use this bigger dish because it'll catch some of the excess liquid in here. Um, but I only have like one set of each of these things. So I was like, oh my God, I have to bake that cake and hurry up and get it out so I can use it to show you. Um, so that's kind of what happened. But essentially what I wanna do is just kind of pierce lots of perforations into my cake just to allow that tres leches mixture to really infuse and get into all the areas of, of the cake. Right? So just kind of go through, make as many perforations as you'd like. I don't know if you can see on your end, but I can see that, you know, it has pretty significant size 
holes that I'm creating here. And so I'm just going through making sure I'm kind of going down the line, right? I'm creating almost like tracks and just kind of going down that track. It's still a fairly moist cake. I'm gonna to try to hide any of the crumbs that come out from the perforation. So I'm gonna throw them into the little break that I have here. And the only reason I'm trying to get rid of some of that is like when I'm spreading the whipped cream, sometimes those little crumbs look like little lumps if I don't have enough of that whipped cream on there. So I'm like, let me just try to get rid of some. So it's like a nice, as smooth as possible surface. Now at this point, my um, tres leches has been sitting on the stove with the heat turned off. So it's not gonna be chilled, but it's going to be a little bit more on just the warmer side rather than full on, um, you know, getting really hot side. So it's probably um, cool enough to the touch. Yeah, it is definitely. And you can see here that my consistency is still fairly liquidy, not as thick as, again, as I mentioned, the, uh, the photo that we used for the uh, tres leches um, that we have been putting up on social, just that one is a little bit thicker just for, I mean, it, it's still gonna taste delicious, but it's going to be um, a little bit harder for your cake to absorb. So you can see here that that liquid is definitely absorbing into my cake. And you can use your spatula if you need to try to like spread it about a little bit. You wanna try to, I'm using like a big old pan here. Of course you can empty into a smaller container if you need to. And then that way you can control where you're pouring a little bit more, like use a, a jar or a cup and that'll help a little bit. Let me try to get those sides. So you can see it's like when I push down all this liquid that's going into the cake, you definitely want a nice moist drenched cake. And then you have quite a bit that is at the bottom. If you let this cake sit, it's definitely going to um, continue to absorb some of this liquid. I like to just carefully, 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 I'm gonna use my fork here as well. Just kind of lift up the cake a little bit, let some of that liquid seep in underneath the cake and then set it back down. Do that on the other side, let some of that liquid, you don't have to do too much because it's so liquidy, it's gonna just find its way underneath the cake. And so you just wanna give it a little bit of room to do so. If it was a thicker consistency, more like a cream than a, a syrup, then you might have to use um, something to help you kind of uh, get it to underneath the cake. Or what I sometimes do if I do have a thicker consistency is I pour down, before this cake is laying on here, I pour down some of the kind of thicker, creamier syrup on the, on the um, bigger baking dish first, and then I put the cake down. So it's already there. And sometimes if it is thicker too, I'll make perforations on both sides. So you can definitely do that as well. And so of course, if you let this hang out, um, if, you, if you, you know, use a spoon and grab some more of the liquid and let it like kind of keep absorbing, it's almost like you're basting your cake. You can absolutely keep doing that. Like you can, lift up your baking dish a little bit, use a spoon, let me grab a smaller spoon that's gonna fit in that size there. And you can keep kind of pouring in any areas that you feel like, oh, that didn't really get, it still looks dry there, it didn't really get um, enough of that liquid or that syrup poured into it. So you can go back and kind of make any adjustments. All right. 
Mine looks like it's pretty coated throughout. Let me get a little bit more of the sides here. All right. Nice. So I am going to go ahead and froth this cake. And I will have my Tres Leches cake essentially pretty ready to go. Let me get a little bit more here on this edge. Okay, that is good to go. Let me grab that frosting again. I have this nice, really smooth, luscious whipped cream frosting made with that coconut cream. I'm gonna actually reserve a little bit since the second batch that I made just now didn't yield a whole bunch. I'm going to use some of that um, and mix it with this one to make kind of equal batches. So you just kind of want to spread it Spread it throughout. Of course, you can use like an offset spatula or something to help you. I'm just using the back of my spoon. I'm not going to, I'm only going to frost the top, which is what you typically see at a Tres Leches. You don't see the sides frosted. It's usually just one sheet of a cake, not a double layer cake or anything like that. So it's typically something kind of like this. And as you can see, I still have a little bit reserved, like I said, that I'm gonna use for the other batch that didn't yield as much. Let me add a tiny bit more. And so we have our cuatro leches, cuatro leches cake right here. So that looks pretty yummy. You can see that nice thickness of the um, of the coconut cream. And if you let this sit out, it will soften even more. It's not gonna really melt down, um, but it will definitely get nice and soft, but you can keep the whole cake in the fridge and that will help it set and hold together a little bit better. So any questions? I may take a bite of it. I have something sweet for breakfast. I have so many sweets right now. I had cheesecake. People have been giving me cookies. It's like, and I, like I mentioned, I'm not a sweet tooth. So I'm just like, even taking a bite of this cake right now, I'm like, oh my God, it's so much sugar, you know? <laughs> I guess my, my one question is, um, if I, like, would you recommend soaking it overnight if I've planned on serving it the following day just so it gets that good good going totally yeah. so yeah yeah absolutely anytime that you can let something like this rest mm -hmm. for a longer period of time it's going to be even better so I would totally let this like hang out in the fridge overnight without the coconut cream frosting mm -hmm. like just the cake just the the syrup you know and then if it kind of dries out a little bit in that overnight process, then I would kind of tilt it and baste it like I was doing earlier and like get even more of that liquid on top and moisten it again. And then at that point I would frost it. Okay, cool. That's yeah. Yes, I'm gonna save it for tomorrow. Gotta visit yes. Grand. I'm gonna do oh, that. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I might yeah. not tell them it's vegan and <laughs> just see what Don't happens. Don't do it. Don't <laughs> do it. I know all of us are like, no. <laughs> It's funny because, oh, my first, uh, the second cake is ready. Mm -hmm. um, because usually if, as long as you know that they don't have an, an allergy, like they're not allergic mm -hmm. to nuts or coconut or whatever, um, as long as I know that, I'll kind of have the fact that it's plant-based or vegan be like secondary. Although at this point, people kind of know because this is right. what I do for a living. Um, but for a while, like I wouldn't tell people and they, they were like, oh, wow, that, that delicious cake you made was great. And then I'm like, oh, it's vegan. They're like, what? 
what? <laughs> They're shocked, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you see, it, it could taste just as good as any other cake. Mm -hmm. You're making it with the same love and care and, you know, probably even better quality ingredients too. Um, so it's bound to taste better. You know, you just have to get like your ratios right and all that stuff. Totally. So yeah. I'm yeah. excited to see how they, how they like it. Yeah. Do video and send it to us. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they like spit totally. it out. This is vegan <laughs> without you telling them. <laughs> how dare you? I know. Vegan. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going to, um, cut a little piece of it so you can see. And then, and then we can, let me grab a plate over here, actually. I'm just going to cut like a tiny little corner off. Of course, the corner is going to be like a little bit more dense, so it might not have as much of the cream in there. When I cut, um, I know you can't really see on your end, but when I cut, um, I can see the liquid kind of squishing out of the cake slightly let me cut this way so you can see maybe it might be kind of too hidden in there let me do this maybe you can get like a drop down view so it kind of squishes out when i cut into it just using a regular butter knife definitely soaked let me bring that here. So have a nice soaked piece of cake. When I probably pierce it with the fork, it's gonna be a little bit squishy as well. So you can see here, like if I do this, you can see all that liquid. It's kind of like, wanting to come out of the cake. So it's like a little sponge cake, right? And when I push into it, you can see all that moisture. I'm like, how do I get you to best see this? I'm, I'm being such a senora right now. I'm sorry, everybody. But you can see all that moisture that is coming out of the cake. So that is the nice consistency that you'll get if you do leave your, um, your cake, uh, the tres leches at that more like watery consistency. If it's the thicker creaminess, again, like you saw in the photos, it's gonna be more wet all around the edges and the center will still be a little bit dry. I'm actually gonna uh, take a bite. Okay, let's see here. So let me pan up a little bit. So I have this nice, delicious piece that is definitely super moist. Just enough of the coconut, just on the cream as a frosting, but not overpowering the whole cake. If you try this and you think the coconut cream is still a little bit too flavorful, um, one thing you could do is like try an aquafaba um, and that will create like a soft peak kind of whipped cream consistency that is less neutral in flavor. That's using like a garbanzo bean um, liquid and that will also create like that soft peak whipped cream. Mm -hmm.